third installment of the MIT Science for the People series. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to say a little bit about what the series is about. So uh, we started the series because some of us thought that we, um, there should be more of a conversation at MIT about the relationship between science and politics, not just how scientific institutions and scientists um, influence the, the broader political life, but also the, to talk about the politics latent within scientific institutions themselves. And I think we'll be hearing about both those things tonight. Um, our first talk will be Professor Jonathan King from biology discussing contradictory US roles in um, the development and control of biological weapons. And our second talk after a Q&A session will be by Subhada Gashroy about um, how the military, the Pentagon funds uh, university research. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good cause, good tradition. Um, so um, currently, um, many nations are commemorating the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of World War I. And that war was noted for particular carnage, loss of, loss of life, civilians and soldiers. Uh, and it was also the first use, gruesome use of chemical weapons. And one of the outcomes, one of the positive outcomes was the passage in 1925 of the Geneva Convention, Geneva Protocol. It was really, most of it was about treating prisoners of, of war, uh, medical personnel uh, during the battle and the wounded but it included the Geneva Protocol, which prohibited the use in war of asphyxiating poisonous or other gases and of biologic, bacteriological me methods of warfare. And generally, it was uh, understood as prohibiting chemical warfare and prohibiting biological warfare. But it didn't, have, it didn't deal with <clears throat> the development of the weapons off the battlefield, development, storage, transport, and it didn't have an implementation uh, uh, protocol or an enforcement uh, pro protocol. Now, biological weapons were not, not a player in, in World War II. Um, wasn't that the, uh, the US uh, had an effort, the Canadians had an effort, the uh, British actually built and tested anthrax bombs and there are still contaminated areas with anthrax spores left over from from that period in World War II. Um, and the Germans had a program, a Japanese program, but they weren't actually deployed uh, in any significant way. Uh, and the military was not interested in biological weapons. It didn't conform to the image of personal courage, of patriotism, of, of discipline. There's no, all, I'm gonna uh, describe a couple of waves of, uh, efforts to develop biological weapons, none of them come from the military. They were all imposed from a kind of uh, hawkish wing that was uh, you know, running the, the country and employing the soldiers, but not, not coming from the troops themselves. Um, now, during the Cold War, uh, unfortunately, many nations began to develop biological weapons capacity. Uh, the best known uh, examples uh, which had been started in World War II was the growth and storing of anthrax bacteria, which makes spores, which are very stable and last for a very long time and are infectious at very low dose, cause a respiratory infection that's lethal if not, not treated. Uh, the U.S. had the, um, the facility that's at Fort Detrick, uh, Maryland, which still exists. The Britain, Brits at Porton Down, uh, the Soviet Union at Sverdlovsk. I don't remember where the French and uh, uh, um, the efforts were loca located. Also in the US, uh, Utah, the Dugway Proving Ground, which was used for conventional uh, munitions testing, but was also used for poison gas and uh, for poten potential biological weapons. Now, um, uh, biological scientists were in general appalled by the notion of um, biological weapons. Uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about the development of extremely dangerous pathogens. You know, most microbiologists and physicians are trying to prevent and save people from infections and biological development meant, uh, you know, developing new pathogens. Um, if you're actually gonna work on these organisms, you actually have to grow them 
And so you actually have to have infected animals or infected cells or perhaps infected people. Uh, one of the features of these programs, um, and it was something that I uh, wrote a lot about, was that there's no difference between defensive biological warfare and offensive biological warfare. They have the same components. They're overlapping. They're indistinguishable. Right? Uh, if you believe that, um, that the Ruskies are going to splash you with Marburg virus and you need a vaccine against Marburg, vi Marburg virus, you have to test it. You have to have an animal or a human being that's infected with the virus so that you can test that the vaccine protects them. Right? And so you have to have actu the actual infectious uh, agent. And uh, it's not theoretical, but it's actual work. Uh, and then it's almost impossible to have real safety, because real safety requ requires everybody understanding that over there, there's a laboratory, and they're handling that, the, that, that virus. And people who work in that laboratory better have health insurance and medical care. We better keep an eye on it. And military security almost always prevents that information from being out there. So everything that we know in the public health world about keeping things safe goes out the window when it comes to, comes to weapons. So the biological community uh, was not in favor of this. Uh, now, strange for strange reasons, still uh, the uh, still studied by academic historians. Now, I am not uh, an expert. Uh, we have an expert on biological weapons on the campus, Gene Greenman. Uh, I, I was an advocate, right? I'm a uh, professional. I'm a molecular biologist and biochemist, geneticist. I'm not a biological weapons expert. I was concerned about biological weapons, and I'm going to talk to you about the advocacy. Um, even more than the concrete history. For the reasons un unknown, President Nixon, at the height of the Vietnam War, announces that the United States will unilaterally renounce the use and development of biological weapons. The moment Nixon uh, makes that statement, uh, all these barriers go down and uh, very soon, 1972, 1973, we get the passage and ratification by 140 nations of the Biological Weapons Convention of 1972, 73, uh, came into power in the US in 75. And this is in force now, right? And the BWC uh, banned not only the use of these weapons, but the development, the testing, and the stockpiling, right? and was without doubt the strongest disarmament uh, treaty in, in, in human history, and, st and still is. Now, um, so things look good. Looked like the genie of biological weapons was going to st stay in the bottle. War in, in Vietnam uh, winded down, uh, declined in military spending and weapons development. and looked like we're going to be able to use that money for domestic resources, domestic science and technology. Unfortunately, when Ronald Reagan got elected president, he brought in a group of uh, hawkish group that uh, attempted to remilitarize uh, the US, US policy and, and the economy and military programs. And of course, if you're going to try to do that, you have to create a, an enemy. You have to create a demon. And uh, his Secretary of State, Alexander Haig, accused the Russians of um, uh, using poison. Uh, well, they were, it was a little vague whether it was biological weapons or chemical weapons, yellow rain in Southeast uh, Asia. Right? So there were, the, there were the reports of yellow rain in this part of the world. And they said it was biological warfare. Uh, Matthew Masselson, professor of biology at, at Harvard, and a long, long time opponent uh, and leader in the effort to critique biological weapons uh, programs, uh, organized a, a counter investigation. And they showed that this was a, an unusual species of bees, uh, and the yellow rain was bee feces, right? Nonetheless, the fact that, that, the, um, that charge was completely groundless. Of course, 
that wasn't why they were actually developing the biological weapons. So Reagan went ahead uh, and they passed two large programs, the BDRP, the Biological Defense Research Program. Hundreds of millions of dollars grants went out to universities and medical schools around, around the country. And they appropriated hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade and reopen the Dugway Proving Facility outside Salt Lake City, Utah. Now, um, one of the results uh, was that the, uh, in Utah, uh, the, the community did not, uh, they paid attention to this. Not that many people living in, uh, in Utah total. total. Uh, they had some history. Um, there had been a leak uh, of chemical weapons and thousands of sheep had died uh, in, uh, outside the Dugway Proving Grounds. All Utahns knew about the death of these sheep uh, in Utah, so they knew that there were imperfections in the system. Uh, and I think there was some deeper discomfort um, around uh, the BW. At any rate, um, uh, a number of scientists, biological scientists at the University of Utah and a number of physicians at the University of Utah Medical Center uh, mobilized, held a number of public forums. Hundreds of people came. They invited other people from around the country to, uh, to come out there. I flew out, out there. I'll never forget it because after the public forum at the medical school, they took me to Mormon headquarters and I met with the elders of the Mormon church something that you know, it was kind of an extraordinary experience, who wanted to hear uh, you know, about concern about the biological weapons. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, there was quite a mobilization. It was well covered in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Salt Lake City newspapers. This was you know, b big news lo lo locally. Um, and the, uh, the local scientists and the local um, physicians did their work in terms of letters to the editor and you know, talking to local groups. Now, um, this is a kind of science for the people. Uh, where did these people learn this? They learned it from science for the people, right? Sherwood Cassians, who was one of the leaders, had been a postdoc to a fellow here at MIT in the days when the MIT biology department was the world leader of the peace movement. David Baltimore and Ethan Cigna led the scientists' strike for peace in um, uh, uh, 1969, 1970. Henry Kendall, who founded the Union of Concerned Scientists. So for those of you as students now, life then was very different. The academic leaders were all outspoken, out there, politically active. They didn't duck their head. They didn't say, oh, I can't do that. I'm just a chemical engineer, right? Salvador Luria, right? All these people came from the tradition of World War II, right? They were, they were escaping from, they had resisted Hitler and Mussolini. And when they came to the United States, they didn't, they didn't forget that. Uh, it is a very different situation now, but it's important to understand that at that time, that was not, you know, such an unnatural thing to do. Uh, meanwhile, the second uh, front that opened up was right here in Massachusetts, out at Amherst. Now, Sprott is going to talk more about the intimate relationship between the Pentagon funding and the university. But this was a classic ex example. So after the passage of the uh, Biological Weapons Convention, the funding for biological weapons goes down. And a certain number of scientists get laid off, uh, those who were working at Fort Detrick on on these programs, eventually get laid off. And one of them, Curtis Thorne, gets hired by UMass Amherst as a professor of microbiology. And of course, he brings with him a research grant, or he gets a research grant under this new biological defense research program to work on anthrax. Uh, like I said, the way you do biological weapons research is you say, what, how would they attack us? What would they use? Uh, and you come up with the most dangerous thing you can think of, 
and then you try to then you have to make it to show that it has those those properties. So anthrax is sensitive to common antibiotics, penicillin. If you know somebody's been exposed, you treat them with antibiotics, they're fine. Uh, so Professor Thorne thought, well, I'll make an antibiotic resistant uh, anthrax. Uh, those of you here who have taken 7, 701 and 712, you know that that's a relatively straightforward thing to do. You have these plasmids carrying genes for antibiotic resistance, and you introduce them into the uh, anthrax, and you select for antibiotic resistance. He was doing it with undergraduates, just like it might have been done here. And the undergraduates at UMass Amherst recognized maybe this is not the best thing to do. So they tried to raise it with the department chairman of the administration. It didn't get very far because he was bringing in money. And, uh, but anyway, at some point, uh, concern got raised. A number of faculty brought it to, to the uh, faculty meeting. And the key thing that happened was a number of members in the community also out of the peace movement. Right, that's, you know, uh, which was very strong in Amherst, went to the Amherst Board of Health and said, this is going to affect the people who live in, in Amherst. It's the business of the, of the Board of Health. Now, these, these headlines say that, that um, uh, the board downplays the risk. But it's true that the final decision was to say, well, it's not that risky, but they had a public hearing and all kinds of people testified at the public hearing. And this is a highly educated citizenry in, in Amherst, Massachusetts. And they understood the problem of making anthrax antibiotic uh, resistant. Suffice it to say, uh, at some point, uh, the university did take action, and they, and they closed down that, that particular research effort. Meanwhile, um, again, coming out of this tradition that, that scientists are engaged in the world, and, and they're responsible for what gets done with their science, the science of people tradition. Um, a number of us here in, uh, in the Boston area organized what we called the Committee on the Military Use of Biological Research. And we had some leading microbiologists from, from the New England, from all around the New England area. Uh, and we organized a petition campaign, the Pledge Against the Military Use of Biological Research, which just says, you know, we won't knowingly work to carry out research that's, uh, that's in this direction. Uh, uh, it, it moved around the country. Uh, and um, to make the, my point about there was a time when uh, leading scientists were proud to step forward. If you look at some of the people who are on this, um, there's Maury Fox, whose 80th birthday we just um, uh, celebrated here. Bruce Albus was the pr future president of the National Academy of Science. Christian Anfinson, uh, protein folding. Um, uh, Dudley Hirschback, Nobel Prize winner in, in, in chemistry. There's many leading scientists. And this got um, uh, quite a bit of uh, national attention. One of those articles is the uh, uh, from one's from Philadelphia, one's from Miami, from the Miami Herald. And we were able to launch a, uh, a legislative uh, campaign. So the one thing that hadn't happened, the Biological Weapons Convention had a very important article, Article 4. And Article 4 said, each nation who is a signatory has to make the terms of this, move the terms of this treaty into their domestic law. It has to be a crime within American society to work on biological weapons. It can't just be an international treaty thing, because then there's no mechanism to deal with a private individual or someone who's not working for, for, for the government. And that hadn't been ratified by, by the Senate. And uh, under these conditions, uh, Given the, 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 the publicity uh, uh, and led by um, some progressive, progressive senators, uh, the, arms, the appropriate committee held hearings in, in, in the Congress uh, and passed, uh, and the Senate uh, passed uh, Article 
Article 4. The Senate and the House passed Article 4 into law. And it is now in the domestic, domestic law if you work on biological weapons. Um, you're in violation of the treaty. That's why everybody, there is no such thing now as biological weapons. There's dual use and select agents, right? You look at the program of four days of people all who have contracts from Homeland Security to develop biological weapons. There's no mention of that. There's just dual use and selective agents. And I guarantee you that the average, even highly intelligent, educated lay person is not able to recognize that when someone's talking about dual use, they're talking about potential biological weapons. What year was this period? Uh, this is 1980, 1989, 1990. OK. Uh, now, meanwhile, there's the International, uh, international Treaty. Um, I think that's, that's, that's right, yeah. Yeah, 1989. Uh, meanwhile, there, you know, things were still going on in the international. Uh, th this is just this is the uh, uh, witness list, the hearings before the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee on on germ war, war, wars, uh, and uh, it's an interesting group of people. Matthew Messelson from Harvard. Uh, who? Anybody here for course seven graduate student? No, too bad. Keith Yamamoto is a leading, leading cell biologist, University of California, San Francisco. Uh, meanwhile, uh, others of us were working on actually strengthening the uh, biological convention. So there were regular conferences. This is uh, September 1991, the review conference where representative of the different nations came together to figure out all right, how are we going to make sure this is carried out. How are we going to implement it? What are we going to do for verification? Suppose somebody accuses, uh, uh, you know, some small nation accuses the Iraqis of violating the convention. What what do we do? How do we act on that? I must admit, at that time, those of us who worked on this, we kind of patted ourselves on the back. We thought, ah, oh, the, for the second time now, right? This genie is back in the box. And we we'll, we got a lot of things to worry about. The nuclear weapons were still blossoming, but at least biological weapons, we thought, uh, no, we got that, got that tucked away. Well, then comes 9-11, uh, and the Bush administration response. Uh, and then uh, some of you may remember the anthrax letters, uh, which I'll actually talk just a little bit about. Uh, and uh, the um, Bush administration reverses co course, and they do a full-scale press to undermine the Biological Weapons Convention, quite explicitly. They appoint John Bolton, one of the leading crazies who's um, still holding out for biological weapons, the, you know, the representative to the, to the conference, and then he becomes the representative of the United Nations. Uh, and they actually sabotage the effort to strengthen the treaty. What are people doing to strengthen the treaty? So the US had been saying, you can't trust those Russians. And so people around the treaty said, OK, we'll allow inspection of any facility that you want to inspect. You think the Russians are hiding something in Sverdlovsk? If you write, you know, follow this procedure, you'll be able to send a team to Sverdlovsk or, or, or Iran or any of the countries, which meant that they could send a team here, right? That they could send a team to Fort Detrick or uh, um, Dugway or, uh, or wherever. And of course, the US is a big player you know, uh, in, in the world market. And so they were able, the US, this effort really significantly weakened the uh, Biological Weapons Convention because it blocked the verification and enforcement. Now, um, at the time, 
a number of us thought, I don't, you know, it was, it's not something we could really document. I don't think we could really document it now. But we were pretty sure that the U.S. was violating the, um, the convention. And some of it w were being done by contracts to private companies who weren't making it in the pharmaceutical industry, in the biotech industry. And so we're getting these sweetheart contracts uh, uh, on the BW front. And of course, they certainly didn't want to be uh, investigated. Now, uh, we now have the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I won't go into it, but the Department of Homeland Security has a billion dollar budget, some significant amount of which goes to medical schools, schools of public health, public health associations, private contractors uh, to develop defensive biological. It's always defensive. All nations, are, nobody does. Of course, everybody is just out there to defend them, themselves. And the aspect of it that reared its head most sharply here was the giving of a contract for a few hundred million dollars to Boston University to build right in the heart of the most populous area of Boston, where Boston Medical Center is in the Boston University Hospital, a biodefense uh, facility. Now, um, given the time, I think I, I was going to go through the, the microbiological basis for why one should be concerned about this, but let me just get, all right. So uh, where were such labs uh, located previously? Very isolated places, right? Out in the desert in Dugway, out at the tip of Long Island to deal with uh, animal, for viruses of animal quarantines, animal infections. Um, the Center for Disease Control is not in Atlanta. It's outside at Atlanta. There's many layers of lawn and trees and barbed wire fences, same with Fort, Fort Detrick. And putting this uh, facility, which was a high security facility, which is going to work with the most dangerous things that those microbiologists can think of in the heart of Boston it was the, totally uh, absurd. Community has organized against it continuously. The building has gotten built. Uh, I think they're kind of getting worn, worn down. The US lots of money because right, they're getting these, 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 these contracts. Um, and they're probably going to go ahead. Now, um, of course, they always claim there's never been an accident. Nobody working at the Boston University Medical Center has ever picked up a laboratory infection. Even at MIT, according to our medical department, nobody, who, no undergraduate who's ever worked in the bio labs has ever picked up an infection. In fact, months and months and months after these claims were made, it came out in the newspapers <coughs> that they had had a serious breach with tularemia, which is a BW agent, rabbit fever. That's, that's why people work on it, with people getting seriously sick. And they hushed it up, and then finally, uh, finally it came out. But this is kind of typical of these situations. Now, let me just say, um, how do you get the security in this, in, in this kind of world? You get security, one, by strengthening the Biological Weapons Convention and strengthening the enfor enforcement and letting people investigate you. Because if you're fulfilling the terms of the convention, there's no reason to keep anybody out. You don't spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars giving it to scientists and saying, think up the worst microorganisms that you and your colleagues could construct, right? And then give us a defense against it, which will mean constructing uh, the organism. It is really uh, terrible. You get rid of the secrecy, which surrounds all of the Homeland Security programs, because you can't find out what, what they're working on. And you can't, right? So even though these were NIH applications, all the experiments were redacted. I, mean, I was called upon to testify about what they were going to do. I knew 
some of what they were going to do. But when I got the official document, they had whited out all those actual uh, experiments. And of course, you know, you have to kind of demilitarize in some ge general sense. Now, we have, um, we do have Massachusetts Peace Action, right? Some of whose representatives are here today. Um, we have a, a rather robust effort of people to recognize that war is not the answer. And I will say, as someone who sits on some of the committees, we have had a hard time to figure out how to get some young people concerned about these things, because we don't think the gray-haired folks uh, can do it uh, uh, alone. And if any, you know, those of you who are here, not because you have to write a paper in a course, but you're actually kind of concerned, if you have some ideas how to do this, uh, you know, uh, we want to know how to do it. The Technology and Culture Forum has been for 50 years trying to raise these issues, and we're also always knocking our head about what's the best uh, way to do it, but we're open. So I've uh, talked too long. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a literature on this that's not a secret literature. Uh, like I said, Jean Guillemin is on our fa faculty, um, and that's a, that's a very good book. And, and this was actually published by the MIT uh, okay. Okay. Press. All right. um, the anthrax, um, one of the juiciest pieces of information. How many people here were alive can you help when the newspapers talked here, about just anthrax contaminated here, letters. Right. Right. And, people, and some people died from the anthrax. Uh, that's right. That's right. That should right. work. Right. Yeah. Um, so there was a very, very systematic investigation of, um, of these, this anthrax, because right? now we have genome sequencing, and they can sequence the, the genome. Uh, and I uh, yeah, just take it out of the way. Uh, I meant to show you the reference so you can look up. The article was published in Science. If you happen to have a PhD in molecular genetics and you had followed the biological weapons program, you could read that article and see that the article showed that the anthrax came from a US lab. That's, it, it actually showed that. You would never know from reading the abstract that that's what the article showed. It talked about mobilizing the most recent uh, methodologies to compare sequences and the genetic variation in anthrax strains. And no, they had been able to show that okay. there were variations in strains with distinctive blah, blah, blah. And then you see one of the figures, and it's a little pathway showing the, uh, that this, these strains must have come from one of the US so. military labs. So that's one of the problems, if yes, where to uh, t where do such dangerous agents come from? So this one they come out of laboratories that were organized okay. to produce them. So go back. OK. So, the, so the forward? forward? Yeah. Oh. OK, I'll just do it there. So I can just use a pointer. Yeah, OK. Uh, microphone working? Yep. OK. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming to this seminar. And it's great to follow John, who is a real practicing scientist, and not only a scientist, but uh, someone who has worked for peace for all these years that I've known John on and off from the days of the science for the people when it existed here. Um, I am actually going to give a talk that's more general um, about the continuing relationship between the universities and the Pentagon. Believe it or not, this is 
25 years after the end of the Cold War, the enemy that uh, we were um, fighting against, building weapons and technological superiority, that is the Soviet Union, has been gone for all these years. But the thinking and the funding, which really uh, is the real thing, that is, you have to follow the money to know what the policy is. And it continues to be no different from what was happening in the deep, uh, in the depth of the Cold War. So uh, this is our effort from the, uh, this embryonic MIT uh, revival of the science for the people to talk about this aspect of even universities like MIT's relationship to the military. And I'll start with a little bit of a, a quick historical overview on how it got all started. And MIT was in the middle of it. Um, and then the, then the Cold War paradigm show a whole bunch of uh, data on the levels of spending and, and so forth. And then uh, talk specifically about uh, uh, MIT. Um, and then have some thoughts about maybe what we can do in terms of looking at what these huge amounts of money that we spend in the name of defense research and development is actually not producing much of a science or anything and creating lots of instability around the rest of the world. So the, the motivation for, my, for me to do this talk is that I strongly believe myself that one of the drivers of the US foreign policy, and I just gave a talk last weekend about this, is this technological overdrive, that these companies that make money push these weapons, but the universities actually have a role to play, believe it or not. So we are, at this time, working a lot in CSAIL and, and AeroAstro and, and chemistry and these departments that are helping directly doing the science and, and some technology that eventually ends up in weapons that are doing terrible things. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just the beginning of the Second World War, uh, in the middle of it, when we got into the Manhattan Project to build the nuclear weapon in, 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 at Los Alamos, MIT was heavily involved, many scientists from all over the country. And it really was the forging of the relationship between the military, because the Manhattan Project was a military project. It was the Manhattan District of the US Army. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so that, that relationship continued after the war. And there was a uh, National Security Council decision, 68 is historically what happened, is how we keep pumping the US economy with the, with the way that we were doing during the war. So we continued this relationship where we were massive spending in the military to pump the economy as well as to win the Cold War. So it has a real win-win situation and, and built up constituencies all over the country, universities, outside university, uh, military contractors, and, and, and and so forth. So, but the positive side was that, and I think there is, and it's anecdotal, and from my point of view, why the science that was happening in the 50s and 60s was actually very good. The Defense Department was leading research in high-speed electronics and things like that. That was the cutting edge of technology. Why is it not so now is, is an interesting point to, to note. <clears throat> but the other aspect of this business is that public money was funding very risky research that companies would not normally do because it is so risky. So even Bell Labs, the invention of the transistor and so forth, this was all done with the Pentagon money because it was highly risky. People didn't know where would it go, where the market will be. So that kind of research was funded by the, the US taxpayer and the Pentagon. And, uh, and the profits, of course, ended up somewhere else. Um, so here is a look at uh, our R&D spending over the years. So from uh, uh, the beginning of the Cold War, 1950s, early 50s, and then throughout the, in the Vietnam War, the Korean War, then the Star Wars, and you keep looking at it, the, the spending keeps going up. The red part is the non-defense, and the blue part is the defense. And typically, uh, it peaked out. Uh, um, in the tail end of the Bush administration, when it was closing at about, I would say about 100 billion. 
the, the blue is showing about 90 billion, but that does not include a lot of the stuff that John was talking about, the real defense spending within the non-defense agencies like DHS, like uh, Energy Department, NASA, and, and so forth, where if you should tally it all up, you're really talking about about 100 billion purely for R&D under the, this is bigger than the national budget of many countries, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so we spend this huge amount of money, and this is a character sort of of this defense R&D spending. Um, it shows, it's very interesting that where we play in the universities is here, the bottom, is about a two to three billion dollar a budget within the Pentagon's budget, it's the basic research budget. The rest is all beginning, this is applied research, then it's more applied prototype building and all that. So, so when you say R&D budget of 100 billion or so, actually very small amount of it goes into real science. Most of it, profit making, building prototypes, and profits for companies like Lockheed, Boeing, and these kinds of corporations, which eventually get something out of this from the university's uh, research, then keep building on it. And that's where the money is. The money is not here. The universities play this huge role of doing the seeding of this pipe, but uh, uh, they are not the beneficiary of the huge amount of spending that goes into profits through these things. And, and, and not, none of this produces any usable technology, very little of it. So <clears throat> that's an important point to note. Um, I just want to throw this in, that when you look at the kind of money I was talking about, 100 billion for R&D, and here it is, climate research, is about two and a half, two billion dollars, that's it. Professor uh, John Holdren, who now is the science advisor to uh, the president, was here uh, last year giving a talk, and he said he was having such a hard time trying to get a little more money for this research. 100 billion in building just gizmos and gadgets that are absolutely useless, and 2.5 billion for climate research. That's it. So, I mean, what are we really doing? Um, so I, my point is here that that, okay, during the Cold War, we did some science, we really had an enemy like the Soviet Union, so we're spending lots of money to get technological superiority. But it's nothing changes. We are spending 650 billion or so now in defense. It has gone down just a little bit because of the sequester. Last year was 700 billion in total defense spending and about 80 billion in, in the R&D. So we continue to spend this money. And now that with the Republican Congress take over, I hear, forget the sequester, it's gone. So we are back again in the good old days. So it's gonna keep going up. Um, and, uh, and this is a comparison, let us say, of uh, just a pictorial comparison of where total R&D, the federal government spends about $140 billion in R&D uh, uh, for the whole uh, uh, enterprise, civilian, non-civilian, et cetera. And you can see this, this, is, this is stuff. The DOD is just hugely dominating. Uh, on campus, and uh, we will talk about it a little bit, that uh, the character of the spending here has changed over the years. Used to be like 80% DOD uh, during the Second World War and through the 50s and 60s. Now things have changed a little bit. So people like John who get funding from NSF and NIH and, and do the life sciences work is a little more dominant. But last year, DOD again became the uh, biggest uh, on campus here, 19%. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so let me now talk a little bit about uh, concretely why is this important? Not only is just the money, but how it impacts our research in certain critical areas. So the money to keep in mind that the universities have to play in basic research is about $2 billion. The real big part is actually a, uh, much bigger than that $2 billion, but I'll focus on this $2 billion, which, which is primarily coming out of DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, which is a research arm of the Pentagon. And also there is some money within the office of the Secretary of Defense that directly comes, but the DARPA is the main funder. And if you look at their grants in these areas, 
double E, about 72%. This data is a little bit old, 2005, because I couldn't find the, I had a briefing from Congress directly, and, and, and they had provided me all this data, but now they are not going to make this data available, so I can't find it the later years. But things haven't changed much because the defense budget hasn't changed much. And so it's, it's, um, um, it may, from 72, maybe 70 or 75, I don't know. But it's a huge number, electrical engineering. Mechanical engineering, 75%. Met metallurgy and material science, 35. Math, computer science, 30. Actually, that funding is going up more now with the artificial intelligence work on campus. This is, oh, this is general. This is general, right? MIT data is not particularly easily available for us to parse and, and look at these numbers. I really need some Europe students to do it and uh, that to really dig into this. But uh, the fact is, in physical sciences and in engineering, the dominant, um, uh, the domination of the Pentagon is uh, just overwhelming. And so my point is, if you are going to be getting their money, you'll have to pay the piper. It's not that you simply take the money and go your own merry way because it is basic research and publish some uh, 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 open journals. The Pentagon wants something in return, so they are focusing on areas where they will fund. So they want to fund in cyber defense, in, uh, in, in WMD, protect counter WMD, counter space. And this is a very serious issue that we need to think about in what we are doing to space. And a lot of the space research comes out of, this, of these universities. And uh, <clears throat> so the, we can, and, and I will actually show that the MIT's research, and these are Pentagon's areas of interest directly align in terms of those research. So it's not that we are, we are able to have total um, freedom. Um, this is a, a, another quick look at uh, ener en uh, the, so from 2004, here's Department of Defense, 18%. I just wanted to show historically, uh, and 2013, this is from the MIT uh, um, Treasurer's book. So this is data that is publicly available on the web. And uh, so 19%, and uh, NIH, uh, which is here, HHNS is 18%. And that, I think it took a drop. I don't know, John, maybe you know something about it. But it did drop down quite a bit. It was dominating there. And the and some, portion of the Department of Energy, is that at all related to nuclear weapons? Some, yep, that's right, that's right. Um, and here are some numbers. So Trish, you asked me the number for the, the oops, sorry. The number for the research, the, that's the number for DOD on campus. And I want to point out that for MIT, we get much more money from the Pentagon. So 128 is the Department of Defense for on-campus research, which is unclassified. We do not do classified research on MIT main campus here. All our classified work is done at Lincoln Lab. So professors who have some dual appointment can work at Lincoln Lab and, and retain classification uh, or, or their, their uh, clearance. And, um, but so it is definitely, and, uh, and if you take the Department of Energy, as you pointed out, there are some work here. Although I, our work at MIT is not nuclear weapons related. It's, it's primarily energy from the, from the Department of Energy. And some are nuclear energy, but not nuclear weapons, yeah. Um, but the, the domination is, is clearly seen. Um, the, uh, somebody asked me a question before the talk. You know, you look at 2009, we were getting about a um, little over 100, and now 128 or so this year. It's generally uh, flat, maybe just inflation adjusted. Um, so uh, we, we get the same amount of money pretty much every year. Huge amount of money, no doubt. So here is the big uh, whopper, which is the Lincoln Laboratory. So Lincoln Laboratory gets now um, seven, about $800 billion. I mean, million dollars. What did I say? 800? 800 million. <laughs> Sorry with that. With Pentagon, the billion and trillion is hard to keep track. A, a, $800 million that Lincoln Laboratory gets every year and it's a part of, part of MIT. So we are really married to the Pentagon. And it used to be called the Pentagon on the Charles. 
when John was here, or maybe a little bit before John, when he was talking about this 1969-70, I heard from Noam Chomsky when the Vietnam protests were taking place. Um, so talk a little bit on the positive side. Though I'm, I'm talking all about the connection of the military and how we are all complicit in all this. But MIT, as, as John also mentioned, that those who are different days with Professor Luria and Vic Weisskopf and all these people who are on campus doing fantastic thing, Noam Chomsky. So 1969, apparently there was a huge protest on campus to, for uh, divesting uh, the two uh, military sort of labs, which became Lincoln Lab and also then the instrumentation lab, which I believe became Draper Lab. And, uh, but the connection with the Draper Lab, which is just across the street, is still pretty close. There are lots of faculty who work and the grad students. Um, <clears throat> so, but anyway, that protest led to their at least uh, divestiture from the MIT's uh, mainline work. And the students took over the, uh, the student center, shut down for a day. And, uh, but the key thing was the president, um, uh, it was before Gray, I forget. Uh, the president's name, but uh, ah, uh, Jerry Wisner. No, I don't think so. I think it's somebody after that. Uh, Professor William Pounce, who I met, he's still on campus, by the way. He's a, a emeritus at um, um, uh, Sloan School, so he headed up this commission to look at the relationship between uh, the military and what we should do about our research and 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 so forth. So the Pounds Commission wrote a huge report. I actually took a look at it some years ago. It's in the archive at MIT. And, um, and Chomsky was one of the panel members. He was flying back and forth Oxford and, and Boston. And when, when this thing was, he was lecturing here, lecturing in Oxford. The students were taking over. It was you know, fantastic at times. Um, uh, and he refused to sign the report, although he was, and I'm not sure exactly what his, uh, but uh, uh, in the, um, um, uh, preamble to the report, I said his reasons and the uh, personal statement he made was a magnificent statement that uh, criticizing that it didn't go far enough. And uh, yes, I mean, it did talk about the divestiture of the labs and so forth, but about the fundamental nature of the why the military, uh, uh, as John said in the pledge in the biological weapons, that we want to have scientists commit to not doing research on. Uh, 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 for military purposes, that's the key. And uh, I obviously, Pounds uh, didn't go that far, the commission. Then it erupted, the campus erupted again in 1980s during the Star Wars, uh, Reagan's, uh, President Reagan's Star Wars days. And, um, and then there was another commission that was headed by Professor Feshbach of the physics department. And, um, and, uh, and they, they found, just like I'm showing, strong dependence on the er, certain areas of research uh, on the DOD, um, and, and expressed concern about the sponsored research, particularly DOD. And uh, they recommended that uh, there should be broad oversight, and as, as, as John pointed out, and I would repeat, that what is really needed, at the least, is much uh, uh, better, closer oversight and openness we got to have this information out for people to make the decision whether they should go this way or that way. Right now, th that's not, not the uh, uh, case. Even so today, we have research areas in autonomous systems, in a artificial intelligence. Of course, we are very big. Nanotechnology, cybersecurity, sensors, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and missile defense. Missile defense is the most controversial area of work that I know something about, and it's being done at, in, in uh, Lincoln Lab. Uh, this is the picture of the MIT. This is actually on MIT website. This is uh, the, the advertisement for the Nanotechnology Center. $50 million just funded directly out of the US Army. So we are pretty proud of our connections. It's not that we are not doing a lot of these things in secret. We, we are getting funded, and we are doing work for the, the military directly. In fact, one of the professors in CSAIL wrote in his report that, I mean, we are really contributing to the national security uh, needs of the country, which is great. But then we should be open about it, that what is the nature of this work? And um, um, so I would say that, that apart from MIT and, uh, in general, that we have a problem with the priorities. I mean, we need, what we need and what we're doing is not really right. And we need to think about that, that we need 
green technology, we need fuel efficient cars, electric vehicles, high speed rail, et cetera. And we spend money on missile defense. On war against terror is this carte blanche thing to sink money. And uh, we spend a billion dollars in, in, in against IEDs. This is a big division for Dietrich in, the, uh, in Aberdeen. One billion dollars, a friend of mine actually is, a, is very high up in this uh, uh, research on IED. We can't, we can't beat it. I mean, it, it's just, uh, I mean, we can't, uh, we have built this up armored army, uh, uh, Humvees and stuff like that, and maybe it has reduced some damage. But the basic problem with IED is not technology. But, I mean, we don't have ground intelligence where, you know, little old lady pushing a, a cart in dropping this mine, and we don't know. And uh, so <laughs> all this money is just, um, anyway. Uh, uh, here's a, just a snapshot of really these misguided priorities. Clean energy, $2 billion. Missile defense, $10 billion. Doesn't do anything. Uh, total uh, research budget of uh, NSF, DOE, NIST, et cetera, I just threw this up, $14 billion. Nuclear weapons, $50 billion. Uh, education, 140 billion. Military R&D and weapons, 190 billion. So, it's just, uh, uh, <clears throat> I, and uh, how much do I have? Oh, okay. Um, so five minutes. Um, this is not really, this is more anecdotal about the, what I think is happening with the quality of science getting degraded with the research now versus research then. Um, uh, I think particularly one of the things is, uh, is this deg degradation of the nature of the pop. This is my own experience having worked in industrial research lab, that when we went from one PI, some technicians, and grad students to this humongous project, you really the number of publications kind of went down. We spent so much time briefing the program managers, that we couldn't actually do the work. Now, this is just a personal experience. There is no data to back it up. Um, but there is no doubt that a lot of the uh, money went from small research to big research starting uh, in the late 70s and just accelerated with the Star Wars for the kind of work uh, that, uh, that I was doing. Um, another thing that is a real problem is that most of these research, um, maybe the ones in the university for publication in journals have some peer review, but the huge amount of money that I showed, it's above the two or three billion that we spend at the universities versus what we spend in, in labs that are industrial labs, very little peer review. This is just nothing. Nothing comes out of these things, mostly. Um, they say, let us. They still, they still keep talking about, so if we say, well, you spent all this money, so what did you do? Well, the GPS. Well, the internet. And yes, I mean, there, there is some, but if you look at the return on investment, how much money we have spent, $100 billion a year for 50 years, that's a lot of money. And the return on investment is really poor, very, very poor. And because um, there is no incentive for the program managers or anyone to really uh, uh, make the oversight uh, really strong, they want to keep the program funded. So, so you need to produce lots of nice PowerPoint charts and just keep going. And uh, <clears throat> um, uh, so my theory is that this character of this spending has to change. First of all, this level has to come down. There's no need to spend $80 billion doing what we call the defense R&D. So there is need for more money in scientific R&D, no doubt about it. And in the, in the non-defense area, I think we're, we're, we're generally OK. But here, this big part, so much bigger than the civilian R&D, is where the problem is. So it's not that I'm arguing that we should cut off funding for military funding in the universities. We should do more research. but but change the character of it, and get much better uh, bang for the buck. Here is something that came out from Royal Society, is a citation index of uh, papers that come out of uh, uh, different countries. And the citation is really showing that the, the US, it, it is dropping, and the China is 
is, is going up. Now, this is just a very aggregate look. It doesn't talk about the quality of the papers or anything, simply the numbers. But it is something to think about uh, why this is happening now. Um, so finally, um, I think that, uh, that um, as uh, maybe just to sum it up, that the, we need to think about this, that we, we went there from MIT's point of view, the Pound Commission, the Feshbach Commission, but nothing really changed. And it is still continuing, huge amounts of money. And when you look at what is going on with killer drones and things of that sort, we do make a contribution in, in, in terms of university scientists in building weapons that are terrible. And we, we, need to, we need to think about it ourselves. And scientists, as, as, as John said, maybe uh, <clears throat> that we need more of a social and political engagement that on campus there should be some conversation, if, if not anything else. I know MIT students are very, very busy. But this is something that's really important. So thank you. Uh, John, do you want to take a shot at it first? Oh, uh, um, I, well, for, as, as, as I said, I think that we are not doing research where it's really needed. I mean, Hadron Collider, for instance, how much money? US is not even participating in the ETA that much. So. Uh, I mean, if we continue to spend 100 billion a year, we don't know what will come out in the next 20, 30 years. So my point is that we need to take a look at what kind of research are we funding with this money. I mean, that is the key. There is very little transparency in this, but we know that one thing it does, that it keeps this whole apparatus, this whole enchilada, that is the defense R&D, which is the weapons producing part of the Pentagon. So you have a $100 billion uh, 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 enterprise, which has a, a small amount at the universities, and then much larger amounts keep going up in making this. And I think that we need to take a fundamental look at this, that do we need to keep this enterprise up, and what role the university should play in that? That's basically my point, yes. there's going to be areas in civilian research where it's a judgment call, right? And maybe, you know, it won't work out. But um, <clears throat> I, I live near the red line uh, in Cambridge. It's very, very important for the economic health of the area. And for many, many, many years, starting 40 years ago, uh, I was upset that the red line in the 1980s was 1920s technology. You know, there was no, you couldn't find out when the next train was coming. It was simple kind of stuff. Meanwhile, three blocks away was the Draper Lab spending a billion dollars a year to make sure that we could take out Moscow, Berkeley, California, you know, uh, Paris, uh, Be 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 Beijing. They're still there, right? And they're still spending an enormous amount of money preparing to launch nuclear weapons which, if launched, will be gone, too. They finally invested some money into the red line. 
<laughs> and what they're doing is they're going to bring it up to 1970s uh, standard, right? Now, that is really, you know, uh, it, it's clear, right? Because the Department of Transportation is right across the street from the Draper Labs, and they're starving, right? And they don't have any sophisticated research. They just draw maps and things like that. Uh, and that's a, you know, it's an issue of national priorities. Right. As I said, Professor Holdren, who is a science advisor, was bemoaning the fact that he can't get five billion for climate research when we spend 80 billion on, on, on building weapons that we don't need. That's the key point. I mean, the enemy, yes, now the Chinese spending has gone up a little bit and the Russian spending is going up, but a lot of it is totally driven by us. Oh, maybe a question here and then you, James. Oh, okay, you, you're going to do that, right, Chris? Maybe a question? Yeah. The gentleman is here first. Yeah. Whichever. Yeah. Uh, this is more of a sociological or a political question. What's keeping the system going? Why, at the end of the Cold War, did we not demobilize what the U.S. has done after every major war in our history? Yeah. Well, I can tell you I, I, <clears throat> a piece of how it works. Raytheon, right? Raytheon is a major military contractor making missiles and, and all kinds of weapon systems. Oh, yeah. um, and they employ thousands of people in Massachusetts. And they have a very sophisticated political arm. And the moment any elected official starts talking about peace <laughs> or shows up at a Massachusetts peace action event and gives a talk, <laughs> right? and the moment that happens, they start contributing money to opposition candidates. They'll look for opposition candidates. And if you're a Michael Capuano, you know, you, you learn this very clearly, or even the state representative, state senators, even city councils, right? When, when Cambridge was going to have an anti nuclear, um, you know, uh, make Cambridge a, a nuclear free zone, I mean, the industries that depended on this money, they mobilized uh, politically. And you know that's a very serious problem because they do have a lot more money than, than, than we have, and I'm, I, I don't have a solution to that except to reveal it, because most people don't know that, you know, and that's that's kind of uh, hid, hidden hidden away. But it does require some kind of that's why it requires a grassroots mobilization, right? David Koch is not going to finance peace. Right? It's just convenient for, I, I, was in, I was a Congressional Science Fellow and, um, in, in, in Congress in 96, 97, so, and then on the House Armed Services, Armed Services Committee. So I, I, I looked at this from a very close uh, personal experience. Um, the politicians, if they are not, if they don't have a price to pay for making these decisions, they will simply ignore it. And uh, so in terms of military contractors and their influence in Congress, uh, the peace groups are there, people like uh, um, uh, Sheila and John and Carol and from Peace Actions, they try very hard to influence Congress. But in general, it is so difficult because every day Lockheed and Boeing and these Reps are always there. They're uh, paid high, big salaries, uh, operate out of K Street. They're constantly there on the hill with dear colleague letters and things of that sort. So you want to cut uh, F-35 funding? It's a, it's a terrible plane. You don't need it. And why are we spending all this money? I mean, our F-16s are, are fantastic. Nobody else has anything like that. But we need an F-35. So F-35, we're spending billions of dollars. And you try to say anything bad about F-35, I mean, your, 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 your telephone operator, your switchboard is just going to go crazy from these calls. So it's, it's very, very difficult that unless popular uh, <clears throat> uh, organizing and people, and that's why we want students to at least think about it, know about it, and they, they, are, they should be in the forefront of at least knowing, if not doing anything, that about th these things. And so it's, it's just very difficult without popular pressure for congressmen to make any other decision. They will simply say, we'll cut your jobs. Uh, Boeing will, sh will just slow down either, in, you know, you, you want to cut F-35? 
will shut off this line in Georgia. That's it. And so the votes are going to be there. Oh, James, yeah. Something that Ralph Nader proposed, uh, I ran across a, a suggestion from him in that regard, and I kind of, it awakened in me an opportunity, a way of thinking about this, that maybe, you know, thinking big actually opens up opportunities that, uh, that you know, piecemeal approaches don't necessarily uh, inspire as much enthusiasm. I, I mean, just as, I mean, without going into the details, what about a complete separation of the military from our institutions of higher education. That's the first thing. Secondly, on the presence of the military, the Pentagon at MIT, there's the visible and the invisible. The visible is when you walk down the corridor and you see the people in uniform, uh, as I did, I think, last Friday uh, or Monday, uh, maybe it had something to do with Armistice, Armistice Day, but there was a person in uniform with a rifle in the uh, underneath the central dome and somebody else in uniform, presumably to help people understand what it was about. So the presence, and, and I'm relating it to ROTC, which I don't think did get mentioned. So I was thinking, well, this is a public space. What if I, I didn't want to be rude, but what if I started singing from the second floor balcony, Nancy War Ballad? Um, would that be okay to do? I mean, who gets to occupy the public space uh, of the university? Uh, and the, the, the invisible are Draper and Lincoln Lab. And so there I'd like to ask you to explain what are the linkages? How are they part of MIT? They're rendered invisible, sort of outsourced. We don't do that, but in fact they are part of MIT, or are they? And how are they part of MIT? Maybe on that uh, particular issue, maybe I'll let maybe uh, John knows more about the Lincoln Lab. Uh, MIT gets overhead for administering the Lincoln Lab. It's a very large sum of money. I don't know what it comes to. It's probably you know fifteen percent. I think it's fifteen percent of that eight hundred million. Yes. It comes to MIT as cash. <laughs> it has no strings. It just goes to the president and the the provost and the vice president for research. It provides a big pool of, uh, of money that's, uh, you know, that talks. You know, it speaks with, speaks with power. Uh, I, I will say one of the, uh, um, as you say, there have been many efforts around the country. The, the effort to get the ROTC off the campus right. was, of course, successful for, for, for many years. One of the invisible successes, well, uh, how you would get the military off the campus in some general case, I, I have no idea how one would proceed with that. I think it would be just great if students in, uh, in course six, where every once in a while have a seminar where they invite Subrata to talk and just lay out these, these numbers and just provide a little space where students could talk without being afraid. Uh, you know, to talk about it. That's there are not a lot of forms. You know, this is six thirty. You know, on a, uh, right. I mean, we have to sneak yeah, these not things. Many students, sneak, yeah, not Sneak <laughs> these things in. Exactly. And this is John's department, and he's a pretty well-known professor. Uh, so uh, we we expected some biology uh, students uh, to show up. <laughs> Yeah, it is, I mean, it, it, administratively it's divested, and Draper doesn't produce the kind of money Lincoln Lab produces, right. because, so Draper's budget is much smaller, and uh, so, yeah, as John said, I think the main thing Lincoln brings, brings to MIT is, is cold oh, cash, and uh, yeah. John? Okay, I, I wondered if there's an impact on the quality of research that can be done because of the military involvement in funding and the consequent, I would guess, secrecy and classification oh, yeah. of information, sure. the li more limited exchange of the results sure. of research right. so that 
We have this sort of going on in each country silo, but there's not an interchange and right. right. science grows so, right. grows. Right. So all, all all those things degrade the quality, right? One, uh, you really need people working on, on vaccines for flu, right? And they're working on vaccines for Marburg because they've identified that as a potential bioterror we weapon. That's one. So you have a diversion from what's really needed. Secondly, they can't talk to each other publicly right. because national security, right? And you sometimes go to a meeting and someone giving a talk and they're funded by DARPA or something like that and you ask a question and they just... Sometimes they say, I can't answer that. That's not so bad. At least you learn there's some hidden information. What's more common is they don't report what they're actually doing. So you don't even know what, what, what to ask. And as Subrata said, the oversight is not, you know, NIH is very rigorous. You have this group of peers, Absolutely. right? And they decide, and it's not run by the administration. It's the most democratic device that probably any human culture has identified for distributing public funds. And in the military thing, it doesn't work out. They, they, don't, they don't allow, they just don't allow it. They have to keep it right. in, in a silo. So the quality of the work, you can do work that's really schlock, right? And, and a lot of it really is sh schlock because they're not doing what's most interesting, right? The Defense Department has put out a thing saying, we want to be able to defend ourselves against somebody taking over a bus. Yes. <laughs> right? right. So how are we going to stop a runaway bus? Yeah, it's a little bit of a problem in civilian society. but not. So you can do some really terrible work on stopping runaway buses. No one will ever care. No one will ever know. No one will ever find out. Right? But a lot of money gets spent. It's absolutely. You had a question. Yeah, I mean, those, those departments, like CSAIL or uh, EE, uh, that they are so dependent on DARPA. Where will they go for, for money? I mean, research money, despite the fact that you have this huge pot of money, but scientists working in the academia and even in some, some research labs that are funded by the in industry, uh, where will they go for this funding? So you, you really have to pay the piper, so to speak. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible problem. I, we need to change these priorities. So, oh, so but John, I think, has a well, point. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wish I understood the answer to that I don't. But the one thing I do know is um, it is true that we don't do a lot of nuclear weapons research here. And one of the grave threats to the world is nuclear weapons. And MIT has a long history of resistance to nuclear weapons. This is an issue that you can talk about at, at, at MIT. You can talk about the fact that nuclear weapons are not the way to go. Now, in April 22nd to 24th, or is it? Sorry, 24th. Yes. April 24th in New York will be the fifth review conference of the Nonproliferation Treaty. Right. And Massachusetts Peace Action and other organizations are trying to get delegations to go to New York, including students. And if stu people can't go to New York, you know, you could have a little event here in support of what's happening in the United Nations. And there, no one would bother you because they're not make because we we're not a center for nuclear weapons research. That's right. Well, can I, uh, That's one reason why it is. But that's the difference between then and now. So that's, uh, 
now it's drone warfare. It's, it's, you know, the way it's being done now is, is, a, is a different, is a different type, a lot of it's a different type of warfare. I mean, you have very active veterans, like Veterans for Peace, and they're leading the anti-war movement. So I see that there's a student crowd is really involved in that activity. So that's part of the answer to your question, you know, the, the grassroots student movement uh, around the, the draft and then, you know, the, the anti-war movement. Uh, we have uh, maybe, uh, not, oh, there's still another. Anybody else? Uh, Jen, you know, both of you have spoken, so well, might as well. He, he raises that hand first. So. One of them. Yeah, I, I think you, we, I don't know if you came to uh, our conference last week here at MIT where we were, we were basically talking about this, uh, uh, we were in, uh, talk about exactly that type of question about democracy, the lack of democracy that is not allowing citizens of this country to have a peaceful non-interventionist foreign policy. How, but that's, that is absolutely important, that, that this is a political issue. It is not just a scientific issue, it's a political issue. How we organize to do science is not just a science issue, but it's a political issue. So yes, absolutely, yeah. John, yeah. yeah part of what you were urging before, I think, was just seeing the horror in the night, in the, instead, there was much more direct connection in addition to the students being thrust to the grass and stuff. But a lot of the examples we gave were that we're doing research to defend against this or defend against that. And I know that there's a lot of discussion in the world about this Starbix, whatever cyber program that was put into Iran, nuclear facilities, which threatened a nuclear accident right. to their uh, in their reactor, the same which we apparently were part of doing, and some scientists somewhere in this country have to die. And there's, I know Cuba has suffered a whole series of biological oh, yeah. anomalies uh, that that they at least think may have had something to do with biological research here, not directed so much at the population, although dengue fever has been mentioned as a possible, but towards crops and towards other things like that that affected the economy of the places. So it seems like to me there might be a direct connection between some of this research and some of the misery being spread around the world, you know, besides the obvious stuff that falls from the sky and bombs and cluster bombs and terror bombs. <laughs> Paul, yeah. So, uh, to me, it's also like, uh, um, uh, I heard it so one day that uh, around the uh, Arab Spring of the is uh, the outbreak in the Africa, where there's a military takeover, and then they also have a uh, program in West Africa. Well, since all these programs are I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, there are many people. Uh, you know, there are many people who um, suspect that a number of the medical programs in in West Africa were covers for, you know, you know, test programs, testing vaccines, etc. Um, it's very hard to document that. You know, you need someone within 
to to come talk about it and you know those people are few and far far between uh I saw a documentary at two o'clock in the morning the other night um <laughs> about the Glomar Explorer. This was a, one of the world's largest deep sea mining ship when I was a young assistant professor that was supposed to be a National Science Foundation project to drill in the deep Pacific. Uh, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people were involved with it. Years and years later, it turned out it was an effort to raise a Russian nuclear submarine that had sunk there. None of those thousands of people who knew that this was not about deep sea mining, but about you know this Russian, um, you know, ever talked, you know, and finally it came out after 30 years. Ted Postel, who was the person who revealed that the uh, a lot of those Raytheon missiles did not shoot down the, the Scuds, right, uh, right, uh, and that the star. Well, well he wrote a, a much more compelling report that the star that the missile defense is failing, yes. right? And nobody at um, Lincoln Lab would step forward and publicly support him, except one person who then got declared, got confined to a mental institution. So, you know, you get you get the message, keep, keep quiet, you know, don't raise a problem. I, so that's the one thing I, ne neither of us spoke about. It does take... Yes, courage. If everybody's out there in the street, it doesn't take courage. Right, if everybody's not out in the, the street, then it's very hard. I never say to students demonstrate. I always say have a seminar, have a little brown bag lunch, <laughs> invite someone to give a talk. Your students. That's the thing that happened. Just put a sign up so that other people see that some people are talking about this. And you know, the first step is a very important step, and it can be just a little step, but. If that's, Absolutely. That's better than just saying, well, what, what, what can we do? Oh, and also, one of the reasons I showed that petition campaign with a low budget operation is to show that, you know, sometimes you can have uh, an influence. And by the way, where did we get the signatures? We all had to go to scientific meetings. We had to, to make a living as a scientist. Well, once you're in a meeting, 100 people sitting in the room, you know, yes, the chair, can I get up and have two minutes? And so I want to circulate a petition. That's a great example. Um, uh, Trish, how f we need to wrap up, right? So James, um, maybe we can, okay. That's right. No, absolutely, about the NSA and, uh, yeah, no doubt. I mean, there is a, uh, a, a, um, a, a an event that takes place about the death of uh, Aaron Schwartz, which uh, does, a lo does a lot of that. And, uh, no, there are lots of potential. We, so before we wrap up, uh, James's point is kind of interesting, that if there are any MIT students here in the audience that we are going to try to have a meeting in the next uh, week or so, to, for those people who have showed up at our seminars, the last three seminars, uh, uh, two seminars, this is the third one, that uh, we welcome any students who are interested in talking about this further and carrying this seminar series forward next year. We have uh, a promise from Professor Chomsky to do an event on, on, on military research on campus, and he has been through it from, the day, from day one so sometime in spring, so to build up to that and maybe potentially other seminars, small brown bags as John is saying, to talk to students. So if any students are interested, please get in touch with Chris, although Chris is getting very busy, I understand, but uh, we'll, we'll try to help him out. Uh, um, and that, so if you want to come to the meeting, it would be, would be very good. So thank you very much, yeah.